It's Sunday, November 19th, and this is The National. In Zimbabwe, a defiant dictator clings to power. The emotional farewell to a fallen officer. How those who knew him best are paying tribute to Constable John Davidson. But we begin with a go public investigation. A Bell Canada employee has some disturbing allegations tonight about the country's biggest telecom provider. She says workers are forced to sell customers products and services they just don't need, don't understand, or can't afford. And for employees, failure to make those sales puts their jobs at risk. Erica Johnson has more. Should the success plan not be conclusive, the next step will be a formal action plan. Andrea Rizzo reads a letter from her employer, Bell, putting her on notice that she needs to sell more products and services to customers. She's worked in a Bell call centre for 20 years and says she's expected to make a sale with every customer, even pushing internet service on a 90-year-old who told her she's blind and couldn't use it. You feel bad because this customer has taken the internet but does not have a computer. Several past and present Bell call centre employees say sales targets like these must be hit or they risk being fired. And they say coaches listen in on their calls, tell them to speak quickly with customers, to bury the price of products and services. It's just been a non-stop nightmare for me. And, you know, I'm not only speaking on behalf of myself but everyone else, it's... It's not just me. And, says Rizzo, star performers who sell and sell are being unethical. They don't mention two-year contracts, she says, or mention that a promo price is going to increase violations of CRTC rules. A report by the country's telecom watchdog says the number one complaint consumers filed last year was that telecom providers didn't disclose all terms or gave misleading information. It's not a consumer-friendly practice at all. Consumers uh, uh, should receive, um, you know, pitches to, to, to buy products they want, products they ask for, products they need. Bell wouldn't give an interview, but in an email said any suggestion that Bell instructs its agents to mislead customers or potential customers about what we sell is completely unfounded and untrue. This senior's advocate's not buying it. I would like to see a public apology from Bell. I would like to see them commit to change their employee practices effective immediately and to never uh, upsell seniors for products or services that they don't need, don't want and won't be able to use. Andrea Rizzo says the pressure to sell has forced her to take stress leave. She worries about the repercussions of speaking out but says the status quo has to change. Go Publix, Erica Johnson joins us from Vancouver. Erica, obviously some troubling allegations here, but how is this landing with the customers who, you know, after all, are just calling Bell for help? Yeah, we have heard from Bell customers who say they feel they have been misled about services. As well, Canada's telecom watchdog is keeping track of consumer complaints. And between 2015 and 2016, the Commission for Complaints for Telecommunication Services investigated over 8,000 consumer complaints. Of those, Bell received the vast majority of them, almost 3,000, followed by Rogers and then TELUS. And Bell's answer to all this is what? Well, as you heard in the story, they say they do not coach their agents to upsell or mislead people. But insiders we've spoken to say workers feel pressured to do that. They're worried about hitting those sales targets. They're worried about keeping their jobs. Obviously, the telecommunications industry, you know, didn't, didn't invent the idea of the upsell. What's your sense of how widespread this is? Well, as you know, we investigated the banking industry in the spring, and back then it started with TD workers who had very similar allegations. They said they too had sales targets that they had to hit. They felt they had to upsell customers. Some of them felt compelled to uh, uh, have unethical behavior to reach those targets, very similar to what we're hearing at Bell. After our initial stories, we heard from employees at all of the big banks. More than 3,000 bank employees wrote us saying uh, they had similar experiences. Experiences, similar pressures. Wow. Erica Johnson of Go Public in Vancouver. Thanks. Thank you. Now, if you work for a big telecom and you have a story you want investigated, email the team at gopublic at cbc.ca. In Abbotsford, British Columbia today, people stood in the rain and watched a parade of grief for police constable John Davidson, who was shot dead in the line of duty. 
Davidson was given a full regimental funeral. Marchers came by the thousands from North America and Britain to pay their respects to a fallen colleague. In a service obviously full of emotion, one of the most heartbreaking moments came when Davidson's children spoke. Here's some of what they said. It's hard to properly capture in words just how special Dad was. In a way that does him justice. He was strong, intelligent, hilarious, sarcastic, humble, and a real piece of work. <laughs> Anyone who helped him on the scene I just want to say thank you on behalf of all of us, and please forgive yourself for not being able to change his fate. I, I can't begin to put towards the immense gratitude we're feeling towards our family, uh, friends, colleagues, and the local, national, and global community. We've never felt more loved and supported, and I wish I could meet, thank, and hug every single one of you individually. It's agonizing to picture a future without his guidance and support. <sighs> but we'll always be able to imagine his harsh Scottish accent cheering us on. Oof. Constable Davidson was shot while responding to a call about a possible stolen vehicle. The suspect, a 65-year-old Alberta resident, has been charged with murder. The CBC's Greg Rasmussen was at the memorial today and brings us this. Oblivious to a cold November rain, a sea of uniforms honoring a fallen comrade. <laughs> Awaiting their turn in the procession, Constable John Davidson's team from the Cops for Cancer cycling charity. It's amazing to see the camaraderie and the brotherhood that we all have for one another. It doesn't matter if we're corrections or for sheriffs or if we're American law enforcement. No one gets left behind, no one gets forgotten. That's what it's all about. They bring Davidson's bike, testament to his love of cycling. In an arena packed with people, colleagues tell of a policing career that began in the UK. His helmet, a memento of those years. I will never forget what he did. Uh, Abbotsford's police chief no calls Davidson a hero, the first to respond to calls of shots fired in a busy strip mall. When that shot rang out, blackness fell on a sunny day in Abbotsford. When that shot rang out, evil won. It was an oily blackness that fell upon our city. It was awful. But Rich says the response to the death has chipped away at those bleak feelings. It's a shelter in the chaos. One of the most moving tributes came from his partner in the traffic unit. JD, you would have hated all this attention and emotion shown on your behalf. You'd have told me that there were others more deserving of this celebration, which is exactly why I will do everything in my power to honor you today and every day. JD, it is my absolute profound honor and privilege Call you my partner, my friend, and my hero. Tango 3, Constable John Davidson, Abbotsford Police Number 386. You are gone but not forgotten. Rest easy, my brother. We will take it from here. Thank you. His brother, two sisters, and other family members traveled from the UK. My brother is not. Um, Still immobile in the casket there. He's off running up a mountain somewhere and helping someone else to get up there too. Thank you very much. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Abbotsford. A soldier has died during a training exercise at an army base in Manitoba. Corporal Nolan Caribou is a reservist with the Royal Winnipeg Rifles. He had been an infantryman with the unit for five years. Caribou was killed last night at CFB Shiloh, about 200 kilometers west of Winnipeg, while on an exercise focused on basic defensive routines, patrolling and raids. An investigation into what happened is underway.
This is the third soldier to be killed during a training accident this year on a Canadian base. In April, one soldier died and three were injured in an accident involving a light armored vehicle in Wainwright, Alberta. Back in March, a search and rescue technician died when his parachute malfunctioned during training in Saskatchewan. Meanwhile, the other story that continues to keep moving to the point where I can't keep track is in Zimbabwe tonight. Adrian. Right. Well, we're trying, Rosemary. It's a place where a defiant leader is still, still trying to cling to power. So when Robert Mugabe's own political party dumped him today, it seemed all but certain that after nearly four decades in power, the notorious president of Zimbabwe was about to resign. That, after all, was the ultimatum, quit or face impeachment. Then, after hours of anxious anticipation, he addressed the nation, but Mugabe definitely did not resign. The operation I have alluded to did not amount to a threat to our well-cherished constitutional order, nor was it a challenge to my authority as head of state and government. So Mugabe delivered that speech while sitting right next to the very military generals who seized control of the country last week. The CBC's Margaret Evans is in Harare following all the twists and turns. Well, perhaps not just yet. All day long here people celebrated an expectation that the old man, Robert Mugabe, would finally resign. Pastor Evan Mawariri leads the hugely popular protest movement, This Flag. He's been jailed five times by the Mugabe regime, but marched against him yesterday without fear. How do you feel about this weekend, what's happening now? Yesterday was incredible. We mobilized the whole country and everybody responded. From every walk of life, from every political idea, from every race we came together because we know that the big idea is Zimbabwe first. And I'm excited that we get it. Even ZANU-PF, the ruling party here, has climbed on board, today offering up the ultimate humiliation to Mugabe by insisting he quit as party president. Further, the resolution is that Comrade Daraji Mugabe should resign forthwith from his position as president. Cue the jubilation. to be offered. What he did is enough. Enough is enough. The people of Zimbabwe showed in numbers that they are fed up with this dynasty. A new era is beginning. Look at my bag. The party that propped up Mugabe for so long now says it will see him impeached if he hasn't resigned by noon tomorrow. Resignation was clearly not on Mugabe's mind tonight as he delivered his defiant address, his military captors looking on. In politics, there are no permanent friends, there are no permanent enemies, there are permanent interests. Promise Makwanaji spoke at yesterday's rally, calling for Mugabe to go. As far as I can read the politics, I think that President Mugabe is already, is already over and dusted with. Anything less would be to dash the hopes of so many here and to risk an anger bottled up so long it threatens to overwhelm. The young especially want their future to begin now. We were not forced even to come here. We just came on our own because we need Zimbabwe to be free at once. You know Zimbabwe used to be the breadbasket of Africa and we, we are pleading or asking God for it to come back to that because we used, we used to give other countries food, not us get food from other countries. It may be a long road, but Zimbabwe's national anthem is being sung with a new pride, no matter the words of the old man refusing to step down. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Harare. Margaret is in Harare. It's morning time there. Now, Margaret, I guess you don't get to be in power for 37 years without being a crafty politician. What's Mugabe up to here? Well, he's clearly up to something, Adrian. And, I mean, as you might imagine now, there are all sorts of 
conspiracy theories out there, partly because there was a lot of shuffling of papers while he read his speech. And at one point in the middle of it, he seemed to lose his place. And General Chiwenga, who is the, the man who orchestrated the takeover, kind of reached over and seemed to be helping him. So now, you know, the Twitter sphere is, is alive with people saying, did he, were there two speeches? Did he deliberately lose pages? At the end, there seemed to be another pile of papers. Did he say he was going to read one speech or did he not? Or does this mean, in fact, that, that he did this with the consent of the army? And, and what might that mean for the army, given that they had this huge welcome on the streets yesterday? People saying you're our heroes because you're basically going to be ushering this man out. Um, I, you know, a lot of people also think that it was, um, uh, you know, unrealistic to think he was going to go. He is, as you say, crafty. He's been in for nearly four decades. Um, he's going to play this clock down to the last minute. And um, he's basically thrown the ball right back into the, into the, to the court, you know, for the, for the army, for his ruling ZANU-PF party, and of course, for the people of Zimbabwe as well. Well, speaking about that, you know, if, if people thought he was going and now he's not, how does that sort of change the mindset of, of those you're talking to? Are they becoming a little more wary? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Actually, before um, it became clear he wasn't going to go down, I was uh, down in the center of town earlier and people were kind of celebrating and partying. And I was trying to get one young woman to speak to me. Uh, and she just said, no, 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 I'm not going on camera. And I said, why not? And she said, you know, in case it goes the other way. I kind of shrugged my shoulders like everybody else at that moment. Everybody was expecting that this was finally going to be the resignation. So some people have been really playing their cards close to their chest and fearful that this is going to happen and it, it speaks to the you know to the to the fear and intimidation with which Mugabe and his ruling ZANU PF party the ones that are just trying to turf him out have ruled this country right so not over yet Margaret Evans in Harare thanks very much Naturally, Robert Mugabe doesn't want to go anywhere. Dictators never do. But the talk of exile somehow, sometime soon, is still real. The problem is, where would he go? It's a particular problem if Robert and Grace Mugabe eventually go as a package deal. The logical destination would be South Africa. That's where their big spending sons live. Their social media posts bragging of their wealth don't make the young men all that popular. But the Mugabe's own businesses and homes in South Africa. And the government seems ready to accept him. Grace Mugabe, though, has some South African legal baggage to deal with. She allegedly assaulted a model in a Johannesburg hotel and received diplomatic immunity at the time. But if the immunity disappears in exile, she might just have to meet justice. Other options, the Mugabe's reportedly have homes in Malaysia, Dubai, and Hong Kong. And Robert Mugabe has been going to Singapore for the better part of a decade for medical treatment, supposedly. And he seems to get along well with the leadership. Grace Mugabe, she said to favor Namibia for the lifestyle she thinks it can offer her. The Mugabe's have money. Where it all is seems a bit murky. The bulk of it likely in their mansions and farms in Zimbabwe, the rest, if a diplomatic cable released by WikiLeaks in 2001 is to be believed, rests in offshore accounts and properties scattered globally to the tune of nearly $2 billion. We're going to have a lot more ahead for you tonight. We will take you to Washington, Rosie, where thousands are gathered to send a message that Puerto Ricans are Americans and they desperately need more help in the wake of Hurricane Maria. And you probably don't know this, you probably don't associate L.A. with oil, but there are hundreds of drilling sites in that city, some just outside of bedroom windows. How safe they are, well, that depends on where you live. And I'll sit down with Jan Arden for a conversation that will resonate with a lot of Canadians. She speaks from the heart about the challenges of caring for her mother, who has Alzheimer's. I was so scared and so angry that it just came across as this... I was an asshole to my mom. My initial thought was just like, <laughs> it can't, like, it can't be true. Um, it's just like, out of all the officers in Abbotsford, he's the only one that, he's one of the only ones that I feel like lots of people have a personal connection with. Um, and it's just like, it's just like, why? <laughs> it doesn't really make sense.
My heart goes out to his family and to the other police officers in our community and uh, it was just tragic. He was such an incredible person. He was always supportive and he was always funny and he was always there if you needed someone to talk to and he would always message me and check up and you know just see how you're doing like just such a genuine person <laughs> and it's hard because now we're all coming together and it's good he's gone and it just it breaks my heart. <laughs> he was just such a great person and I can't believe it. I read about him, he was such a good man. It's the least we can do to give support to his family, to show that we care. And like every day they're out helping us. In a place like Abbotsford, I never expected a policeman to get shot. My nephew's a policeman in Edmonton, and every time there's a shooting there, I think, I hope I don't, it's, I hope it's not him, but it's, it's actually to pay my respects to a wonderful, wonderful man. You just hope it never happens, and then it's uh, sort of like right in your backyard, so it's uh, a real shame. Was John? I don't know him personally. I didn't know him personally, but I know that a lot of the kids at the school thought he was just fantastic and uh, could really see him as being a friend versus a, you know, a figure of authority. He was friends with all of them. I, I know some of the Abbotsford police officers, and. I've worked with them and they've helped me out in my work and I, my husband's a firefighter and it just, I think people don't appreciate what these people do. Every day they go to work and they put their lives on the line and I think, I just hope that it makes the community realize what these people are really doing for them and it just breaks my heart. and. I, I just wish we could wrap our arms around the family and the friends and, and his fellow workers and I'm, I'm just speechless, I'm heartbroken. We take for granted these men that go out and put their lives at risk. Thank you. On the National Tonight, Ontario is forcing 12,000 college professors and other employees back to work, ending their five-week strike. The Liberal government here in Ontario pushed through a bill during a rare weekend sitting. Being in that room, hearing what the politicians had to say, I didn't feel like the students' voice was heard at all. I didn't feel like the faculty's voice was heard. Just because the strike is over doesn't mean the problem is over at all. A major issue, 70% of faculty have unstable part-time or contract work. When 500,000 students return to class as early as this Tuesday, they'll all be anxious for details about promised refunds. Colleges have been told to tally up the money they saved during the dispute. The Premier of Manitoba is taking to social media to explain what his office is calling a hiking accident in New Mexico. It happened in the Gila wilderness, 2,200 square kilometers of protected forest in the southwestern United States. Ryan Pallister and his wife Esther were hiking separately on a vast network of trails when the premier says he became lost and broke his arm. A six-hour hike turned into an 11-hour ordeal. I'm glad to be home, glad to be alive, thankful for the help and support of a lot of people that uh, uh, got me back here. Pallister hasn't yet responded to questions from the media, but did post this video to Facebook. The premier says there was no cell reception where he was hiking, but his wife did manage to alert police. I was late getting there, and it was dark, so he should have been there by then. Police eventually found Pallister at the start of the trail. They say people get lost in this part of the forest once or twice a month. Check out this drone footage. It shows the nearly 800,000-liter oil spill from an underground Keystone pipeline in South Dakota.
The company says it's dispatched more crews and equipment to deal with the spill and that its investigation is progressing. Still no word on the cause, though. That spill has re-energized protests against the proposed expansion to the Keystone XL pipeline to be constructed largely in an rural, a rural area, rather. As Kim Brunhaber shows us, though, in the U.S., the physical impact of the oil industry is also very much an urban issue. For a surprising number of people, it's close to home, right in their backyards. It looks like a decent enough place to live, a cozy two-story downtown apartment near the University of Southern California. But walk around the corner and you find this. So close you can see you can touch the, the window and the wall at the same time. Beyond this wall, an oil drilling site. We thought it was a construction site for a long time because we didn't know that this sort of thing happened. But uh, I guess there's oil here? Yeah, there's oil. Los Angeles is home to the largest urban oil field in the country. There are almost 800 active wells in the city of Los Angeles and almost 4,000 in L.A. County. It's one of the things that surprised me most when I moved to L.A., not just how many pump jacks there were in the city's core, but how close they were to people's homes. Drive a little further and you end up here in this beautiful park. Widen out the shot, there they are, moving rhythmically like giant metronomes. In this area, in South LA, there are almost 100 wells, on average two tennis court lengths away from residential neighborhoods. Behind this wall, there's a slant drilling operation right across from houses there, and as you can see, right next to a baseball diamond. Maya Golden Krasner from the Center for Biological Diversity came out to meet me near one of the jacks, meters away from this guy's cookout. Recently, we compiled data from the state of California and discovered that a lot of California's oil is particularly dirty, and in fact, in some places, is um, dirtier and more energy intensive even than Canadian tar sands. And drilling itself has huge impacts. It can release um, hydrogen sulfides. Those can cause burning lungs, um, nausea, nosebleeds, dizziness. It releases benzene and other similar chemicals that are carcinogens. Here is a sponge. It's okay. It's so hot inside I'm sweating, but Alexis Camilla has kept her windows closed for about six years, ever since she first smelled it. Como huele. The odor is so strong, she says, they try to perfume it with the smell of fruit or other things. We suffer a lot from headaches. It's contaminated air. From up here on the roof, you can see it, a drilling site that for years, neighbors say, made them sick. It's maybe about five times I was to the hospital because I have a lot of headache. To find out why, I go back to that first site in downtown LA and meet up with community organizer Nikki Wong. Um, right behind this gate, you know, not 20, 30 feet from bedroom windows, and there's no local notification to neighbors that this extremely toxic, corrosive um, substance is coming into close proximity to them. Wong recently published a review of studies that examined the health effects of drilling sites. There's a lot of evidence for chronic exposure to toxins contributing to long-term significant health um, issues. The companies will say, well, we test the air, you know, there are no, you know, uh, adverse effects being found. A lot of their standards for emissions um, those limits were really set for worker safety. It doesn't consider um, people um, who live next to the site 24-7. You notice something else when you visit these urban drilling sites. Take this downtown neighborhood. It has the second lowest household income levels in the city. 70% of the residents are non-white. It's a very clear racist. Go west, she tells me, to the richer areas. So I do starting in Beverly Hills. Unlike the downtown ones, this drilling site is totally covered. The next one is even better disguised. First, I couldn't find it, but you can see it there. It just looks like an office building, no windows. The entire pumping operation is totally hidden, so it's not an eyesore. And as you can see, it's totally enclosed, so it prevents pollution. Big difference. A report by the NAACP released this week found that African Americans are exposed to 38% more polluted air than white Americans because so many of them live so close to oil and gas operations. And then there are the leaks. 
So right next to these houses, there's a pump jack here you can see. And just last week, residents found bags of dirt soaked with oil, evidence of a 6,000 liter spill, which wasn't disclosed by the operator. And you can still smell the oil. Now the city of Los Angeles is studying new regulations, a mandatory 760 meter buffer between oil production and homes, schools, parks and churches. But here, for instance, when we can see it right across the street, that wouldn't be possible. You'd have to shut this one down, for instance. Yeah, they need to shut down. And that's the problem. The oil pipes and jacks are like roots and branches in the city. Authorities predict that the buffer would shut down 90% of the city's oil production. Industry advocates say that would kill a potential oil boom since Los Angeles is sitting on one of the richest shale oil reserves in the U.S. If the city of L.A. and the state of California, you know, really props itself up as uh, climate leaders um, in the country, I think this will be a real um, important sort of testing ground for if we're going to actually uphold that. Back at the downtown site, McCandless is heading out to yoga before her classes. She still doesn't know what to make of what's happening feet from her bedroom, beyond the wall. At this point, we're not sure, and we're also not sure how long we'll be living here, so... Mm -hmm. But for Camilla, moving would be too expensive. Her only hope, she says, that buffer the city's debating, which would push this operation out of her neighborhood for good. I hope they listen to our voices, she says, and that officials will help us in our battle. Until then, she says, they'll have to play indoors and keep their windows closed. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. The debate around urban oil isn't going away. Culver City in the greater Los Angeles area plans to add 30 new oil wells over the next 15 years and allow fracking right in the city. Still ahead, two months after Hurricane Maria, and more than half of Puerto Rico is still in the dark. Thousands march today, pleading for more help and demanding an end to being treated like second-class citizens. But first, Jan Arden opens up about a challenge hundreds of thousands of Canadian families face, caring for a loved one who has Alzheimer's, her mother. She phoned me one day and she goes, you have to come over here and show me how to use this phone. I said, well, you're on the phone right now. I'm not. I said, you are on the phone. Well, for God's sakes. They're coming to your door. My name is Scott, and I'm from PhoneSafe. I'm currently taking applications for your rate reduction on long distance. Those offer incredible... They're coming into your home with aggressive television ads. Unitel, save up to 35% off Bell Canada long distance. Call now. It's happening right across the country, and the bombardment of ads can be overwhelming. Some ideas become extinct, like high long distance rates. They're called long distance service companies, and in the metro Toronto area alone, there are more than 30 of them out to get your business. It's a service that Bell Canada still offers, but no longer monopolizes. In the mid-80s, the CRTC told Bell to share the long-distance business market. This past summer, it told Bell it also has to share the residential market. Most of the push for change came from Unitel, Bell's main competitor. Like Bell, it has its own infrastructure and phone lines and is considered a network. Unitel says the beneficiary of this kind of competition is the consumer. We're offering prices that are at a minimum 15% lower than the telephone companies and depending on the package that you can sign up with Unitel, you can save up to 35% off the telephone company prices. There are other companies in the market smaller than Unitel known as resellers, companies like Visiontel. It has some facilities, but mostly it rents time and phone lines from the bigger companies. With lower overhead, it can offer customers cheaper rates on long distance calls. All U.S. calls, irrespective of time of day, we guarantee 45% off of the bell rate. Canadian, 35. And internationally, 20. And there's a variety of even smaller subcontractors and agents that lease phone lines and offer discounts. It's always 30% below whatever discounted rate they already received through Bell. And 10% on international calls. We decided to compare long-distance rates just to sample the kind of savings that are available. 
we chose to call Regina from Toronto. The call took place at 8.30 p.m. on a weeknight and lasted 5 minutes and 34 seconds. With Bell, the call cost $2.14. With Unitel, $1.66. And with Visiontel, $1.70. In order to get those savings, it means more dialing. First, you have to dial seven digits. To get off the Bell line and onto the alternative system, 10 more digits are required. To identify yourself for billing purposes, then you dial your normal long distance number. Bell is reacting to the onslaught of competition with full page newspaper ads and a public campaign to keep its clients from slipping away. It was important to them. The meals became really important. It was something they looked forward to, and it was something that I could do. Because what do you do? What do you do when someone starts forgetting who they are? It's a very helpless, frustrating disease, and I hate it. Jan Arden's big heart is no secret to the singer's many loyal fans. Now as she talks about caring for parents with Alzheimer's and dementia, that heart is bared like never before. Her story is increasingly relevant to Canadians as an aging population puts more and more of us in Jan Arden's shoes. The stats don't lie. The number of Canadians living with dementia or Alzheimer's is growing. As of 2016, there are more than half a million Canadians living with the disease. In 15 years, that number is expected to rise to almost a million and cost Canada's health care system over $16 billion a year. It will also obviously impact a lot of lives, including Jan Arden's. You probably know her for her music. I've got a good mother. And for that wicked self-deprecating wit. Oh, you got hooters like this that get in the way of everything, everything. Hey, really nice, nice to meet you. Meet you. Really nice but these days, we're seeing a new side of Jan Arden, one she kept private for a long time. The world within a life caring for her aging parents who'd been married for nearly 60 years. Her father had dementia, among other things, and died in 2015. Her mother has Alzheimer's and is declining. Living with that and them is the basis of her new book, Feeding My Mother. It's recipes, remembrances, pictures of the literally lonely road and the little joys. I met up with Jan Arden to talk over tea at the Drake Hotel in Toronto. When was the first moment you realized that something was happening with your mom? My sister-in-law had been over. My brother and her had a cat, and the cat passed away. And she's like, for heaven's sakes, the cat died yesterday. Don't say anything to him about the cat dying. She must have said it to us 10 times. My mom said, we would never say anything about the cat dying. I'm like, no, it's cool. You tell him. Phone rang. 30 seconds later, it is my brother on the phone, just saying hello to my mom. First thing she said, well, your cat died. And I had this feeling in the pit of my stomach, and I thought, this just isn't forgetting where your car is parked. This just isn't forgetting how to set the clock radio or little banal things that happen in day-to-day -day life. This is, something's wrong. And I ignored it for probably another two and a half years. I just chalked it up to garden variety memory loss, although I knew it was much more horrible. So your mom starts losing her memory, and, and nobody really talks about it. Nope. But then your dad's sick too. Yep, dementia. But he had a different kind of dementia. He had more physical problems. My mom was his caretaker. And I can't explain what happens within the construct of a, how a person operates, but my mom's operation manual told her to look after my dad and to do these tasks, which she was very capable of, of doing. But I also knew it was making her worse. Was your mom aware of your dad's decline? They were so hilarious, Adrian, the two of them. Like, well, he's completely insane. He can't do anything. And I'm thinking, you are a close second. Let me tell you what, the two of you. Is that why you started to write it down? Because the, how, how am I ever going to convey I, this? <laughs> I was actually really scared. And I remember typing, sitting on my couch. And I'd always kind of written journals. I guess they call them blogs now. And I'd always kind of written journals 
but I'd never written about my folks because I, of course, am in denial completely about any of this happening, that they're going to get better. And I wrote it down, just that the stuff was going on. I can't even remember the first entry, but I know my office called me the next day and they said, have you noticed what's going on with your Facebook page? Basically, a million people have seen your entry. And I just was shocked. And along with that, we had 4,000 comments. And it hit me for the first time. I bawled my head off trying to read through them because it made my problem seem so insignificant. Is that the first time you felt a little less lonely? Yes. I don't know why there's so much shame involved with memory loss and with Alzheimer's. But what is the shame part? What, 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 is, what is there to be ashamed of in terms of memory loss? It is. It's shameful. Like when I stood in, in the room with mom and I hear her just off to the side repeating a story for like the tenth time. And I had a friend going, it's okay. And I was ashamed. I'd be like, oh my God. She's on the tenth time because I was so scared and so angry that it just came across as this, I was an asshole to my mom quite a lot of the time oh, so when this started happening. Very brief with her. I was the memory police. I'd correct her. I'm still very much in denial. We haven't had the official diagnosis of Alzheimer's at this point. So I'm fighting it. I'm correcting her. If she saw, oh, there's people with orange hats in your yard. And I'd be like, where? Where are they? And I'm so scared, but I felt myself go into this person that I hate so much. Thank God she's gone now. But I would take mom and I'd say, let's, let's go. Let's walk across the yard and let's go see where these people are. That's what I actually did. She was defiant. She still is to this day. Jan, I know you can't see them, but I can. And they're right there. Did it ever hurt her, though? I, oh, there was lots of tears. There was lots of stuff of her and I standing in the driveway. It lasted for probably 18 months, 20 months, especially when I had people come and start helping. I'd say, Mom, you can't be alone here. When I'm working, you can't be alone. And when they started coming two and a half years ago, it was those goddamn homeless women, and they're doing all their goddamn laundry in the house. This is my mom who never swore she in her life. She thought homeless women had moved into yeah. the house. And it was very volatile. There's a lot of crying on my part by myself because she'd say, I hope you get this. You're the worst person. You're the worst daughter. And it was so hard. I just said, Mom, I'm doing what you would probably do for me. I would never do this to you. I would never have people in your home. And I was so trapped. I had you know, friends that would say, you know, you should start looking at places. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to just give up. I don't even know what I'm doing yet. I, I want to ask you about your dad, and I'm, I am sorry, it was it's wrenching to read about him dying. Um, what was that day like for you inside your head? He had rallied many times. I thought, he'll come around. And uh, my little brother's like, no, I don't think so this time. I mean, he was unconscious, they were giving him morphine, but it was the most god-awful thing I've ever seen. My mother, sitting in the corner, said, would it kill them to give him a lozenge? She had no idea. Alzheimer's is a gift in that department. Temper sentiment somehow. She wasn't crying or anything. So the Alzheimer's sort of smoothed the edges of her grief. My mom is not sentimental anymore. My old mother would have been so besieged with grief. I, I think it would have killed her. But this version of my mom, she said, well, he sure put a damper on my birthday. She knew it was her birthday. You, you asked her at one point if she thought she'd forget you. She said, my mind might, but my heart won't. It was a very hard thing to hear. Um, she will forget me at some point. She still knows who I am now. Oh, it's you. It's the weirdest things that go. She phoned me one day and she goes, you have to come over here and show me how to use this phone. I said, well, you're on the phone right now. I'm not. I said, you are on the phone. Well, for God's sakes. I'm like, that's pretty good, Mom. I'm sure one of the care workers helped her. She says, well, what do, how do I hang it up? I said, follow that cord down to the click. Mm. She hung it up. Are you scared for your own health? Yeah. 
crosses my mind. But you know, we all have our roads to walk, but uh, chances are pretty good that I, I could very well have memory loss. It is something that's pretty prevalent these days. But hopefully I'll do it with some grace and style like my mom does. I know there is this hunger that people want to hear what you have to say because I think they, they need to hear that they're not alone. What would you tell them about what to be careful of? The day the tides turn for me, it's a relatively simple thing. My mom had once again pointed out to me that there was people on my deck, always with the orange hats. I felt this part of my spine, you know, go up, oh, here we go again. And I just went, oh, well, you'd think they could pick up a broom. And it was the nicest thing, because she said, well, you'd think they could, and we were done. We were just off onto something else. I go where my mom goes now. Alzheimer's, you better not deal with the future. You just have to deal with the day, because there is no future. You cannot plan. You cannot live like that. You have to be where you are. End of story. Good spot to end. Jan Arden, thank you very much. Thank really you very much. It. I appreciate it. And speaking, Rosie, of appreciation, uh, Jan Arden also says that she knows she's pretty lucky, that she has some access to income. She says, you know, I'm not Beyonce, uh, but I do have access to some funds, and yeah. so I, I can do a lot for my mom, and she's well aware that, frankly, most Canadians uh, aren't in that spot. Yeah, I found that conversation so raw because there are so many people that sit at a table talking about aging parents and how to deal with them, and dementia and Alzheimer's continues to be something that we just have not figured out yet. Yeah. Thanks, Adrian. When we come back, Paul Hunter is on the ground as thousands march in Washington, demanding help for hurricane-ravaged Puerto Rico. What faith do you have that Donald Trump is listening and will take the right action? I have little faith in him. You know, he's, he's more worried about building a wall for Mexico than helping the people. He needs to help the people of Puerto Rico. And the Juno goes to Jan Arden. After 18 years of penning lyrics and humming melodies, suddenly Jan Arden seems an overnight success. Jan Arden! Five nominations turned into three awards at this year's Junos, including Female Vocalist of the Year. Very much. The recognition comes after a busy year for Jan. She's been touring at home and in Europe. She released her second album, Living Under June, and hits like Could I Be Your Girl have been striking a chord with audiences wherever she goes. He is the darkness that seeps into your fading light. Oh. Everything changes, just your whole life changes. How you think of yourself and trying to keep your feet on the ground and trying not to, trying not to change, but part of being a human being is changing. And but you just try not to change too fast and too much. There will be no consolation prize this time the bone is broken clean. No baptism, no reprise, and no sweet taste of victory. At Springbank Community High School, just outside Calgary, Jan was known as class clown and star athlete. Her musical success came as a big surprise. I was just amazed when I saw her on TV the first time. I didn't know she was singing. I saw her on Canada AM one morning. Could have knocked me over with a feather, really. She was just an athlete. She was never in our drama productions that I can remember. I enjoyed this a long time ago, but I'm sure she didn't have anything like that on her mind when she was at school. But what most at the school didn't know was that Jan had been writing songs since she was 14 years old. I just did it secretly because I'd found a serious outlet. And a lot of people have asked me why humor doesn't, you know, go into my songs. You seem like a really easygoing person and da-da-da-da-da. And I just decided that my music was off limits to that, that I finally had a way to um, express myself seriously and to be taken seriously. Not, not to have anyone else take me seriously, but to have myself take myself seriously. It might be hard to believe Jan ever lacked self-confidence, but the fact is her transformation from lounge singer to Juno Award winner had its rough spots. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, and um, 
or what I was doing with my life. And, you know, when you're working in bars all the time, you know, I was not a very, very good drinker. I just wasn't good at drinking. Now, whether or not I had a, I mean, to me, it was a problem because it affected the quality of my life. You know, I was doing stupid things and cracking up cars and, but just being young, being in my 20s and truly thinking that I was immortal. Maybe you might have some advice to give on how to be insensitive. Could learn from you all. You must remain on this case. You're my best chance. It exposes more than the truth. Paint me, Thomas. An all-new Murdoch returns Monday, December 4th on CBC. Demand the right of the people of Puerto Rico to live fairly. Thousands marched through Washington today demanding equal treatment for the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico. They say they feel like second class citizens and that inadequate help after Hurricane Maria really hammered that home. The CBC's Paul Hunter was there. On Capitol Hill, they chanted. And they marched. And by the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, as they all did throughout the day, they held that flag high. Today we say enough. Today we raise our voices for Puerto Rico. Lots of them. The red, white, and blue of Puerto Rico. Today, Americans of Puerto Rican descent vented that despite the fact all Puerto Ricans back home in Puerto Rico are bona fide American citizens, these days it sure doesn't feel that way. Yes, American aid followed Hurricane Maria, but no, they say, not nearly enough of it. And those images of Donald Trump tossing paper towels to needy Puerto Ricans, an insult. There are millions of tax-paying Americans in Puerto Rico who could use a helping hand. Yeah. It's a disgrace how our government has, has abandoned the, the 3.5 million Americans in Puerto Rico. 3.5 million Americans. It's unheard of. There was determination. That black and white version of the flag stands for resistance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And there was star power. That's Broadway's Lin-Manuel Miranda, now a powerful advocate for Puerto Rico. Congress, if you can hear me. Warned Miranda... In the fallout from the hurricane and other issues in Puerto Rico, many tens of thousands are now moving to the U.S. mainland, with most soon eligible to vote. His message to lawmakers... When you vote for a relief package, remember that it's not just the sane thing to do, it's not just the humane thing to do, it's good politics. And yet, that question, is Donald Trump listening? I have little faith in him. You know, he, he's more worried about building a wall for Mexico than helping the people. He needs to help the people of Puerto Rico. To the president, they say Puerto Rico will rise, so ignore its needs at your peril. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. In Puerto Rico itself, two months after now Hurricane Maria, people are still struggling with the basics. To give you a sense, power has only been restored to half the island. And even in those areas, there are frequent blackouts. There's widespread damage to the water system, making people vulnerable to illness. The governor of Puerto Rico has been asking Washington for $93 billion in recovery aid. So far, Congress has approved five. It's hard to get your head around how much damage remains in Puerto Rico until you actually go there. The CBC's Joanna Rimeliotis did, and you'll see what she saw starting tomorrow on The National. Entire towns here have no power. Homes are leveled. It's hard to see the ruins below until you do. Yeah, careful with the nails. We meet Edwin Colon near the town of Albonito. He shows us what's left of his house with the eagerness of someone who feels forgotten.
Watch for that story and more of UNO's reporting throughout the week here on The National. Up next on tonight's show, we'll take a look at what other big stories we're watching for this week. It's a busy one. And remember, you can go deeper on all the stories of the day earlier in the day. Subscribe to our newsletter, why don't you? cbcnews.ca slash The National. The National Today takes you inside our journalism every single afternoon. Robert Mugabe, having now made the transition to fully-fledged dictator, sought comfort today amongst his fellow African rulers. It was a shrewd calculation. More than a few of his African peers share his notions of democracy. L'Afrique. African Union Commission Chairman Jean Ping read a bland statement calling on Zimbabweans to work together in the interest of their country. Only Kenya's prime minister referred to Mugabe's murderous methods of retaining power. Raila Odinga favors outside intervention. My view is that uh, the African Union should not accept or entertain Mr. Mugabe. He should be suspended until he agrees to allow the African Union to facilitate uh, free and fair elections between him and his opponent. Mugabe forced Zimbabweans at gunpoint last week to install him as president for a sixth term. Yesterday, he was offering to negotiate with the opposition he's been brutalizing. The opposition leader, though, has taken refuge inside the Dutch embassy, fearing for his life. The inauguration is a meaningless exercise. Uh, the world has said so. Zimbabweans have said so. So it's an exercise in self-delusion. Britain's Prime Minister agreed. The message that is coming from the whole of the world is that the so-called election will not be recognized as legitimate. In Washington, the administration called the election a sham and threatened sanctions. We, we will press for strong action by the United Nations, but we could also act unilaterally. And this afternoon, the UN Security Council was considering a US-sponsored draft resolution rejecting the rigged election and imposing an arms embargo on Mugabe. If we do nothing, uh, if there is no response, what does that say about the council? The question is whether Mugabe can continue to count on his friends at the UN to run interference for him. China and Russia, and most importantly, South Africa, have so far seen to it that Mugabe has been blamed for nothing. They've blocked or watered down one resolution after another, and already China is saying today that it's opposed to the American push for sanctions. Neil McDonald, CBC News, Washington. Some of the stories we'll be following this week here on The National. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will be in Newfoundland and Labrador on Friday to apologize to residential school survivors in that province. About 1,000 former students accepted a $50 million package last year to settle claims of sexual and physical abuse along with language and cultural losses. The province had been left out of the national apology and compensation package back in 2008 under the previous government. And for this hour, Elizabeth is not only a queen-to-be, but a bride. 
The bells of Westminster Abbey in London will ring tomorrow just as they did in 1947 to mark the Queen and Prince Philip's 70th wedding anniversary. Buckingham Palace also released this new portrait of the Queen and Duke of Edinburgh. And the Toronto Argonauts are Eastern Division champions. The Toronto Argonauts will face the Calgary Stampeders for Grey Cup next weekend. This will be the fourth time the two clubs have met in the big game. The 105th Grey Cup kicks off a week today here in Ottawa. I will try to get really excited about it, Adrian. <laughs> That's the National for November 19th. Good night, everybody. Good night.